Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Dave Zwicky. I am an assistant professor in the libraries uh, and School of Information Studies. Uh, and today I am going to be talking about patents and trademarks. I will talk a little bit about intellectual property, maybe a little more generally, but uh, patents and trademarks is, is my thing. It's what I'm, what I'm always happy to be talking about. Uh, so let's see here. Okay, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm an assistant professor. I've been at Purdue since 2014. Uh, I am newly promoted, so I will be associate professor uh, in, a, in a month or so. Uh, I am the chemical information specialist uh, in the library, so that goes along with my background in chemical engineering, and I work quite a bit with uh, the chemistry department, chemical engineering, materials engineering, uh, industrial pharmacy, and basically, if there's a little bit of chemistry in a topic, I'm probably connected to them in some way. Uh, I am also the patent and trademark specialist. Uh, Purdue is a member of a United States Patent and Trademark Office program called the Patent and Trademark Resource Center. And we, uh, you know, we, that's us. Uh, that, that's me. That's the Patent and Trademark Research Center. Uh, I've also been the president of the Patent and Trademark Resource Center Association, and uh, you know it's a big it's a big part of what I do. All right. So uh, before we get started, I was hoping I could get uh, everyone to uh, answer a little poll, um, which I will launch right now. Okay. Uh, basically, I just want to get a feel for the room. Uh, how familiar are you with patents and trademarks? Uh, from a one, which is, I'm, I'm a complete novice at this, to a five, I am Donna Ferrillo. Uh, I am an IP lawyer. So, you know, just to, just to get a feel for what we're dealing with. All right, so pretty, pretty even across the board. All right. Okay. Looks like we've got one more person joining. Oh, a couple more. All right. Okay, so give that another second or two. All right. Ben, in case I didn't say it earlier, thanks everybody for, for coming out today. Uh, this is a an odd time of year, an odd time of the decade. And, uh, you know, this is the first time libraries are are doing this kind of, uh, this kind of activity. And we're happy that uh, people could turn out. And, you know, hopefully this will be worth your time. All right, so I think that that helps me. Uh, I appreciate everybody who responded, and we'll end that poll. Um, for the record, uh, it looks like uh, you know most people you know have a little bit of knowledge about patents uh, and trademarks. Not terribly you know confident in it. For what it's worth, I put myself at about a four. You know, I'm not. I don't have the. I'm, I'm not a lawyer, etc. Uh, but uh, just, just so you know. All righty. Close that out. All right. So my plan today is to do a little overview of intellectual property, uh, then get into the basics of patents, the patent process, talk a little bit about patent searching, and then time permitting, talk a bit about trademarks. Uh, I am the patent and trademark person but just given the nature of what we do at Purdue, the heavy STEM focus, um, patents tend to eat up the bulk of my IP work. So I mentioned earlier, I'm not a lawyer. That is a disclaimer that I very clearly need to make. Uh, I am a librarian. I am a member of the faculty. Uh, nothing I say today should be taken as legal advice. Uh, if you have a legal question, talk to somebody who has that credential. Um, this is purely informational and, uh, you know, hopefully enriching, but not necessarily, uh, you know, something that you should rely upon uh, for a serious, you know, legal question. And also, this is not comprehensive. You're getting the, the intro to the topic, not the whole, not the whole ball of yarn. All right, so to ease us into this, I thought I'd talk a little bit about intellectual property as a whole. Um, so there are 
four main types of intellectual property in the United States. Copyright, which is administered by the Library of Congress, trademarks and patents, which are administered by the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and trade secrets, which are not regulated by the government. Um, intellectual property is often misunderstood, but it is very important to the way our economy works, and it's very important uh, in terms of making sure that you are being responsible in how you apply it. Uh, whether you want to protect your own intellectual property or just make sure that you are using it responsibly, that's, that's, the, that's the main thing. So I should mention I'm not the copyright expert. That is Professor Ferullo. Uh, but one of the main forms of intellectual property that we deal with is copyright. Copyright specifically protects ideas. And no, I should say expression of ideas. When it's in your head, it's not necessarily protected. You have to tangibly express it. Uh, copyright is intended to protect original works of authorships, and it lasts a very, very long time. Uh, there is an exception to copyright. You can use copyrighted material if it's fair use. Uh, there's a balancing test there, and I'm not going to get into that because that's not my my area of expertise. Um, but it's it's a it's it's a nuanced issue. Trademark is specifically designed to address identifiers used in commerce. Um, logos, slogans, uh, product names. Basically, if it's not specifically being used in a commercial setting, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to apply trademark to it. It's regulated by the USPTO, and it lasts effectively forever as long as you keep using it. There are trademarks uh, from the late 1800s that I believe are still in force. I want to say um, a brand of rope and a brand of borax are two of the two of the big ones. Um, but you know, the, the way to lose trademark protection is just to stop using it. Uh, there are a lot of criteria for what goes into being trademarkable. Um, the biggest two um, are it can't be simply descriptive. Um, there's actually been a, a Supreme Court case that just was argued a couple of weeks ago uh, that was talking about whether adding .com to a common word makes it distinctive enough to, to warrant trademark protection. Um, so you can't, you know, I, if I call my business, my apple picking business, delicious apples, that's probably a bit too generic to really be trademarkable. Um, there's also a confusion issue. You can't get a trademark on something if it could be confused with a trademark that already exists for something else. Um, I couldn't call my computer company Red Apples because that could be confusing. Um, and it's also limited to a specific class of goods or services. So if I'm in, if I'm selling, I don't know, bulk chemicals and I want to call my chemical business Apple, you would assume that that would not infringe on what Apple Computer is doing, because who would confuse them with a bulk chemical manufacturer? Um, and again, not a lawyer, so don't don't try to start a bulk chemical company and call it Apple. I'm, I'm trusting you all on this. Uh, oh, and um, Donna left a message in the chat. Uh, www.lib.purdue.edu/uco for all of our Purdue copyright information. Uh, there is a fair use exception for trademark, but it's it's more limited than it is for copyright. That brings us to patents. Patents protect inventions. Uh, inventions are things that are new. They're novel. They haven't been done before. They are useful. They actually do a thing. They can't be purely decorative, and they can't be obvious. Obviousness is tough to define, but the, the criteria is if somebody who is of average skill in a given technological area can take a look at an improvement and say, well, that's that's just the next thing you do, uh, that would then that's obvious, if that makes sense. Once you have a patent, you can you, you basically have a 20-year monopoly on this invention. You can prevent others from making it, selling it, using it, importing it, incorporating it into new inventions, all sorts of stuff. It also runs through the USPTO, and the process can take two to three years. 
um, from when you file to when you actually get your patent. Uh, when you see patent pending on something, that usually means they have their paperwork in, but the USPTO hasn't actually gotten back to them yet. Um, and that, that time does eat into your 20 years, because it's 20 years from when you first file. Uh, but because you have that sort of patent pending thing, uh, it's, it's usually a pretty reasonable trade-off. Uh, and the, the catch for this is that in order to receive this patent protection, you have to fully disclose the nature of your invention. Because once that 20 years is up, it enters the public domain and everybody can use it, build on it, et cetera. Um, and that, that's important and that we'll come back to that later. Uh, there are three types of patents, uh, utility, design, and plant. Uh, nine times out of 10, when we talk about patents, we're talking about utility patents, patents that do useful things. Uh, design patents are for industrial design and plant patents are for a certain type of non-hybridized, uh, asexually reproduced horticultural product. Uh, and that comes up very rarely. Uh, the fourth type, which I'm not gonna spend too much time on, is trade secrets. Uh, trade secrets protect things that the public shouldn't know. Uh, basically formulas, processes, things that you don't want to patent because then it would eventually enter the public domain, but you also want to keep them protected. Um, the classic examples are the kernels, uh, herbs and spices for Kentucky Fried Chicken and the formula for Coca-Cola. Uh, they are secrets. Um, they're not regulated by the government. It's all done through uh, secrecy and non-disclosure agreements and non-compete clauses and that kind of thing. And trade secrets last forever as long as they stay secret. Once the secret's out, it's, it's out. Uh, if you can reverse engineer things. That's not against the rules of trade secrets. Um, but, you know, that, that's about it. All right. So... With all that out of the way, we can get to the fun stuff. We can talk about patents. Um, so why do we care about patents? Why is this something that the university would care about, that we would want to teach our students, that, you know, would excite someone like me? Well, uh, patents are a source of, are a form of literature that is often underused. Um, very frequently students get a look at the scholarly literature, but they don't get a look at the actual literature that, you know, maybe isn't as scholarly regulated, but is just as important to their careers. Um, technologies and patents are not often found in the scholarly literature. Um, if you are working for an R&D department in a large company or a startup, um, you don't, you're not often incentivized to publish in science or nature. You are very often incentivized to get a patent because that, that's worth money. So there's this whole parallel track of information that exists out there and patents are the way to access it. And also by definition, patents are new and non-obvious. They're innovative. You know, there's not every patent is guaranteed to be a winner. Uh, there are some silly things that have been patented, and I'll talk more about that later, but there's a, a value to this. There's a treasure trove of innovative technical information that is available out there. And even if you're not planning on inventing something, using patents, you can stay abreast of current technologies before they hit the market. You know, you can avoid wasting R&D time on something that somebody else has already done. Um, if you want to know what Intel's going to be putting out in the next 10 years, look at what they were patenting 10 years ago, you know, or are patenting now. So patents, extremely valuable, extremely important, and worth our time. So if you haven't had a chance to, to really spend any time looking at a patent, uh, I thought I would just go through the, the parts of a patent for you. Um, this is the front page. This is what the front page of a patent typically looks like. Uh, you'll notice all of these fields are numbered. Um, that's a standard format for patents. So even if you're getting a patent from another country, from another jurisdiction, field 54 is always going to be uh, the title. Uh, field 45 is always going to be the date it was issued. Um, 
the date it was, it was issued, incidentally, we don't really care about too much. Uh, we, we care about the filing date. Uh, this was filed in June of 1987. Assuming everything went smoothly, this would have lasted until 2007. Uh, so we've got uh, the inventor, person who invented it. We've got the assignee, the company that they're working for, the entity to whom they've assigned the rights to this invention. We've got some claim, uh, some uh, classification information, some references cited, but I want to focus for a minute on the title. Generally spherical object with floppy filament to promote sure capture. That's a mouthful. And that's a mouthful way of saying a Koosh ball. A Koosh ball is a generally spherical object with floppy filaments to promote sure capture. Got my, my little Koosh ball here. Uh, that sort of brings us to the really important piece about patents. They're not written in normal human language. Uh, they tend to be written by people who have a STEM degree of some sort or a subject specialty of some sort and a law degree. Uh, so it's a, it's a potent combination of technical jargon and legal jargon. Uh, and that makes dealing with patents occasionally challenging. So with that said, you know, we've got our drawings. Uh, every element of our drawings should be numbered. Uh, then every element of the drawing that gets numbered has to be explained. Uh, after the drawings, you will get the technical details, the background, the description. And this is often where we would help students extract technical information. Uh, this is usually the, the most straightforward part to read. And this is going to give you the information that you would need to replicate this or work with it in some way. And then at the end of the patent, after the description, the drawings, and all that, uh, is the claims. It's going to be a numbered list that describes the precise legal definition of the patent. Um, the drawings are great, the description is great, uh, but if you're trying to figure out what is legally protected, what is specifically protected by this patent, you would need to very closely parse the claims. The claims are the hardest part to read, they are the hardest part to write, and this is why patent lawyers make a lot of money. Because, you know, being able to protect exactly what is there and not more and not less is a very specific skill. All right, so that's the sort of the basics of the patent process. Sorry, the basics of the of, of what a patent is. Uh, and incidentally, I am going, I am monitoring the chat. So if, if anybody has questions as we go, uh, I'm happy to sort of work them in. So feel free to, to message me. All right. So let's move on and let's talk about the patent process. So let's say you want to get a patent. Let's say you have invented something that is new and that is useful and that you think would, would be both beneficial and valuable. What do you do? Well, the first thing you do is you figure out if this is going to be worth your time and money to pursue. Because again, this is a long patent, getting a patent can be a long process and it can be a pricey process depending on how you do it. So you wanna figure out, you know, is there a market for this? Is this something that, uh, you know, I will actually be able to sell once I have my, once I've gotten further along in this process? Uh, if it's not gonna make any money, you might, not be interested? Well, you might still be interested, but you know, it's, it's a little more questionable whether you want to pursue a patent. And then you want to look at what's called prior art. Uh, that's uh, the jargony patent term for all of the information that exists out there in the world that could describe your invention. This is the does it already exist thing. And so you would search patents and you would also search the scholarly literature, you'd search Google, you'd basically try to figure out if this is as new as you think it is. And, you know, then you make a decision. Is it worth going forward or is, is, would this be challenging enough that it maybe is not worth doing? And then if you decide it is worth doing, you do everything through the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office's website at uspto.gov. 
you could, you can technically file by mail, but they really, really, really don't want you to do that. Um, they will charge you quite a bit more if you do it that way. Uh, they want you to do it online. Just it's easy for it's easier for everybody involved. Um, you do not have to have a patent lawyer. Um, it is not required, although it is probably recommended. Uh, it is possible for an inventor to act pro se, to file on their own and act as their own lawyer. Um, it may be it may be more challenging that way, but it's it's probably going to be cheaper. Um, and the process again can take several years. Um, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has a backlog right now of I want to say somewhere around 15 to 18 months before they'll even look at it for the first time uh, just because of the volume of applications that are coming in. Um, they keep trying to bring that that latency down. Uh, I, I, I talk to them every year at, at the conference that, that we have for the Patent and Trademark Resource Center and a couple of years ago, they almost had it down to a year, but then people just decided they needed more patents and it just keeps creeping back up. All right, so you've made your decision to file, you've started work with the USPTO through their website, and then you make decisions about your strategy. Um, are you doing a utility patent or design patent? Do you wanna file in the US or internationally? Um, there's, there's a bunch of different decisions that you need to make, um, but it usually comes down to are you willing to spend money or are you willing to spend time? Yeah. You can pay the USPTO to get to the front of the queue faster, but is that worth it to you? And I should mention, it doesn't necessarily matter how fast you get your patent. And it doesn't matter how, who was the first person to invent something. What matters in the US and in, in a lot of other countries right now is who was the first person, for, first person to file the paperwork. Um, we used to be a first to invent country, uh, but in 2011, there was a uh, patent uh, reform bill called the America Invents Act. And now the earliest person to file the paperwork wins the dispute. Um, there's also uh, issues related to disclosure. Uh, you don't want to publicly disclose your invention uh, too far in advance of when you file uh, because what you remember I talked about prior art before? If there's information out in the public sphere that explains your invention, you can't call it a new invention. Um, if you disclose too early and then wait too long to file, you can count against yourself. You know, you can't get a patent on this because it was publicly disclosed, but I was the one who publicly disclosed it. Doesn't matter. You know, that, that is something that, that trips up a lot of independent inventors, uh, people who are not, you know, people who are working for themselves and not working through a larger organization. All right, I should mention, um, there are resources for people who are not, uh, able to work with a normal sort of patent lawyer situation, uh, if they're under-resourced or if there are other issues. Um, the IU School of Law has an intellectual property clinic. Um, I actually don't know what's going to happen to that in the current situation, but they usually run uh, every semester and they, you know, the intake time is a little weird since it's always related to the start of the semester, but uh, they, uh, you can get reasonable advice from uh, law students under the advice, uh, under the oversight of a law professor. Uh, there's also a pro bono program. Uh, every state or some, and sometimes clusters of states has a pro bono program for intellectual property that's overseen by the USPTO. And in Indiana, it's Indiana Patent Connect. Uh, so patentconnect.org. They will find IP lawyers who are looking to do pro bono work and match them up with inventors who don't have the resources. So it's a, it's a nice service that, uh, that is being offered. Uh, I should also talk about invention promotion companies. 
There are companies uh, which you may see advertised to you on late night television or on Facebook. Those are the two main places I've seen them uh, that want to offer to help you patent and promote your invention. These are largely unregulated. Um, the USPTO and the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, do try to keep records of them if people make complaints. But if they steal your intellectual property, the USPTO and the FTC can't really do much about that. So um, be careful. Check out if you're if you were if you are ever thinking about working with one of these groups. Um, do some background uh, research on them beforehand. Uh, I also want to talk about uh, provisional patent applications. This is this is something I see a lot because it's it sounds real good. Um, it's a, a cheaper and easier and faster way to file. But um, a pat, provisional patent application is a simplified filing tool. Uh, you have to give the USPTO a clear description of the idea for the invention and usually the drawings and some other little bits and pieces of information. And then you get to the front of the line faster. Um, you, it, it, it reserves your filing date. Um, the problem is it goes away. The provisional patent application gives you a year in which to figure out if you can commercialize this to, to work through all the details of creating the full application. But if you don't file that full application within the year, it goes away. I've had a lot of people come talk to me and say, well, I've got a provisional patent on this. No, no, you don't. You have a provisional patent application in the system. And that's good. But if you don't follow through, it's effectively worthless. So um, just, just something that independent inventors have been known to run a follow up. All right, so you do all of your application, whether you use a lawyer or a service or whatever. Um, and eventually, after 18 months or whatever, it gets to a patent examiner. And the patent examiner says, yeah, no, we can't do this. This is not patentable. Maybe they say a good thing, but usually the first result is, an, is a rejection. Uh, and then that goes back to you and you make arguments about why they're wrong. And you go back and forth with the examiner until you either get to a get to the point where they sign off and say, okay, yes, this is, this is patentable and you get a patent, or you just can't come to an agreement and you get a final rejection. Um, and the examiner is gonna be looking for novelty, uh, usefulness, non-obviousness. They're gonna do a lot of patent searching on their own. And you know they may end up saying, okay, we can accept claims one through nine, but claim 10 is not gonna fly. And then you make modifications and then it, it goes through the rest of the way. And then you have a patent. Uh, you don't actually get uh, a certificate anymore. Uh, they stopped doing that a couple years ago. As disappointing as that is for everybody, you know, you, you really wish you got that nice seal on there. Um, but uh, no, you, you get an email. You just get an email. And you have a patent, so you can ha use all of those patent rights, uh, but it, you just don't get, the, you don't get the nice, you know, seal of the United States on it. Um, so once you have a patent, you can make something, sell it, use it, um, market it, commercialize it, license it to somebody, prevent other people from doing all of those things. Um, but what you need to do when you have a patent is you do need to pay maintenance fees. Um, there are requirements to pay fees at uh, three and a half, seven and a half, and 11 and a half years after issue. And uh, you need to pay them or it just enters the public domain early and you need to watch out for potential infringement. Um, patent infringement is basically doing any of the things that the patent grants to you if you're not, if, the, if they're not, if somebody isn't you. Um, getting uh, dealing with patent infringement is usually a case of a for, uh, federal lawsuit. And the, the deciding factor is almost always gonna come down to the patent's claims. You know, 
are they written in such a way that whatever it is that person did is acceptable or not? Um, the picture I have here of the uh, Android phone versus the uh, iPhone, there was a pretty big patent lawsuit not terribly long ago uh, about the form factor of the invention of the of the smartphone. Uh, Apple has a had or had I think it's expired had a design patent on the specific uh, outline with the round corners and the bezel, and there were several Samsung phones that were never able to be imported into the U.S. because uh, it was, you know, Apple filed a lawsuit saying this infringes on our patent or this, this style of phone. And um, yeah, I think there was something like eight or nine different models of Samsung phones that were not allowed to be brought into the U.S. because they were uh, too similar to what Apple was doing. So uh, that's the kind of thing you can deal with uh, in, in the patent infringement space. Um, Another example that uh, I like to talk about because, you know, I'm the chemistry person and this, this is pharmaceuticals are, are a heavy part of that. Um, there was a dispute uh, recently between Idenix Pharmaceuticals and Gilead Sciences. I believe Gilead is a subsidiary of uh, Eli Lilly. I could be wrong on that. Anyway, they both had uh, hep C treatments and it was found that Gilead's uh, was infringing on a patent that Idenix had, had done. And it went to trial and Gilead was found to have infringed. And the court penalized them 10% of their product sales. Um, and they had sold $25 billion worth of this hep C medication. So the, uh, the fine effectively the damages were 2.5 billion. And I believe that's been knocked down on appeal. Uh, I don't think Idenix is going to have to pay Gilead 2.5 billion in the end, but that can be the scale of what we're dealing with in when it comes to patent infringement in you know, these big industries. All right, so I've, I've talked about patents from sort of the technical information side of things, as well as from the sort of the commercial side of things. Um, now I want to make the case for patents in some other areas, in some different fields of study. Um, patents, I would make the case, are incredibly important historical documents. If you want to track the history of science and technology and innovation, um, it's all right there in the patent literature. Um, you can track how these problems were solved in the 1890s, the, the, the 19 aughts, the 1910s, and all the way forward. Um, you can see how they were, these ideas were building on each other, uh, how they were iterating towards whatever we have today. Um, and these are non-academic sources. You know, you're not going to find necessarily all of this in you know, an academic paper of the time. This is all from a commercial space. So the information that you have uh, available to you through the patent literature is, you know, a parallel track that really captures the history of this, you know, of, of, of how we solve problems as a society uh, in a more concrete way than you would find in other forms of literature. Uh, patents are also powerful design documents. Um, and I'm talking about design in a couple of different contexts. Um, we have a term in engineering, uh, the engineering design uh, process, which is about creative problem solving. Um, and patents have a role in that, but they also have a role in specifically aesthetics. Uh, design patents, uh, you know, 10% of the time we're talking about patents, we're talking about design patents. Um, cover sort of the industrial design of a product. I mentioned the rounded corners on the iPhone. Um, you can see this, this pat design patent here for a spiraled high heel. Uh, things like typefaces, things like fashion can all be protected by design patents. And that's incre increasingly interesting, uh, an increasingly interesting area with the rise of 3D printing. 
you know, if you 3D print a piece for something you're building, could you be violating design patent? Could you be infringing on a design patent as opposed to a utility patent? And that's that's an interesting space and an interesting thing to discuss. And in the design sense, patents can also just give be a source of inspiration. Uh, there's information, you know, that you can see these things and see, okay, maybe they can inspire you to do some variation on them. So um, I think there's a lot of really interesting opportunities there in the artistic space beyond just the, the technical space. And that brings us to patents as educational documents. Uh, and I, you know, this may just be my bias as a person who is deeply invested in both teaching and patents. Uh, but I think patents are a wonderful tool uh, in a variety of different subject areas for teaching. Um, they're publicly available. You're not going to have to deal with any licensing issues uh, in terms of getting access to these documents. Um, they are relevant to the real world. Uh, they are relevant beyond academia. And they uh, are something that is going to be commercially, you know, important to your audience. Um, and also, um, you know, this is this is the one time in here that I'm going to mention some some actual research that I've done. Um, patents uh, can, I mentioned the the engineering design process. Patents can be a wonderful uh, source of inspiration for creative problem solving. Um, when uh, a group of students is trying to figure out how to solve a specific problem using technology. Um, going back to the patent literature and seeing how other people have attempted to do this is incredibly valuable. Every patent is a case study in how this prob this or that problem might be solved. Students also, uh, this is something that uh, my co-author Margaret Phillips and I found, um, can be used as validators for ideas. Um, you have an idea, but you're not sure if this is really something that could work. Um, and you might take a look at the patent literature to see if somebody else has already done this, done something this way. Um, it, it, it's not, you're, you're not try, intending to copy them, but you're, you just want the validation that, okay, I'm on the right track. And patents can do that. All right. So, hmm. I'm going to speed through this a little because patent searching is, is maybe a little more technical. Um, I, I always tend to go on a little too long when it comes to talking about patents because I just love them so much. Uh, but we will, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about patent searching, then we'll get into trademarks real quick. All right. So in the past, if you wanted to do a patent search, you had to go to the patent office in Washington, D.C. and search through Thomas Jefferson's shoeboxes. Literally, they had, they had big, he kept his shoes in, a, in basically wooden filing cabinets, because he did, and uh, that's where they stored patent documents that you could search uh, for many, many years. Nowadays, there are all sorts of free resources online. Um, public documents are searchable. Um, there are also paid resources that you can use, but... Um, you know, we've got these online resources and they're great. Um, there are also patent and trademark resource centers scattered throughout the, uh, the country. In Indiana, we have two of them. Uh, one of them is me. And the other one is my counterpart at the Indianapolis Public Library. And we offer, you know, non-legal patent search tutorial services. All right. So, why is patent searching something that we need to teach? Can't we just do Google searching? Well, it comes back to the language issue that I mentioned 15, 20 minutes ago. Um, patents tend to use this complex legal technical jargon where they often use obsolete terms, deliberately obfuscating terms, and that can make keyword searching difficult. I have this penny farthing bicycle up here because my absolute favorite example uh, is you know, if I do a patent search for the word bicycle, I'm going to find a lot of stuff. I'm not going to find the patents that describe the device as a velocipede. I will not find the patents that describe it as a two-wheeled occupant-propelled vehicle. 
And that means that my keyword search for bicycle is not as effective as it should be. Uh, so instead, we have a classification system. Uh, it's basically a call number system for the world of technology. It breaks it down into bite-sized parts. And if you find the right call number, the right code, uh, you find all the patents in that area, regardless of what language is used to describe them. There have been a couple of different systems over the years. The US used to have its own bespoke system. We don't anymore. Uh, there's a broader international system, but that's too pedestrian for us to use. Um, so we currently have a system called the Cooperative Patent Classification System that was developed in partnership with the European Union and Japan. And I believe uh, South Korea has signed on to it. That is uh, a really, you know, fairly sophisticated way of narrowing your scope. Um, you can find classifications on the front page of a patent. Um, you can see we've got international classification and US classification written right here. Um, we don't use US anymore, but international maps well enough to, to the cooperative system that we can use it as a proxy. So the way the classification system works um, is we start at these high level categories. Um, things that are necessary for humans to live, chemistry, packaging, and then we narrow it down uh, by adding additional terms until we get to something that is as specific as we can get. So we go all the way from A, which is, again, things humans need to live, to food, to dairy products, to milk substitutes, to milk substitutes containing uh, only mater uh, materials from oil, seeds, or nuts. So in this case, soy milk. Um, all right. So classification is an effective way of searching. It is not always an intuitive way of searching. Keywords are an intuitive way of searching that is not always effective. My advice to most people uh, is to use both. The United States Patent and Trademark Office has an approved seven-step method for doing a patent search. And that is a good method, but you know, maybe it's a little overly complicated for you know, most of our needs. Um, so the way I tend to describe patent searching is like this. It's an iterative process. You're going to get it wrong the first time, so you just be prepared to do simple searches, take what you find, and make them more complex. You use keywords to find relevant classes. You use those classes to find patents. And those patents will suggest new and better keywords, new and better classifications. And you will eventually cycle through this enough times to zero in on your area of choice. Um, it's a brainstorming exercise. It's a, you know, a record keeping exercise. Um, and it's not a fast uh, exercise. Uh, patent searching, real, comp, you know, thorough patent searching will take, you know, hours, if not days. Um, but it sort of depends on, on how, much, um, how much you're trying to do. All right, some other ways of searching. Uh, you can search on specific inventors, see what else they may have invented. You can search on specific assignees, see what other company, what other things that company might be doing. Uh, you can take a look at the patent references. And patent references are actually kind of interesting because they are uh, added by both the inventor and by the patent examiner. Uh, so the inventor will put in their references and then if the examiner is going through and spot some things that look like they are going to be relevant, they will add those to the reference list as well. So that can be a useful way of, of getting that information. All right, so let's talk where can you find patent stuff online. Um, well, there's Google Patents. Um, google.com slash patents. It has international coverage. Um, it's only really supporting keywords. It doesn't do classification searching that well. And when you start getting into older patents uh, before like the 1970s, the keyword searching gets a little sketchy. Um, because what they're doing really is those, they just have Im page images of those and they're running them through optical character recognition to convert them into text. And Sometimes that works better than others. Um, there's an example I like to use. Um, Harry Houdini, the famous escape artist, uh, 
patented a diving suit uh, in the 1920s. I think the 1920s. Um, if you search for it on Google Patents, you won't necessarily find it because Google Patents translated that document to Habby Hapdini and his Diver Stit, S-T-I-I-T. -I -I so that can be an issue. That said, it does nice Google things. You know, it's, it's very easy to use. Um, the European Patent Office has a wonderful patent search tool um, called Espasnet that is international in scope, um, has limited full text coverage back to the 1970s, and is really good for classification searching. Um, they have a really nice sort of interactable, interactive outline tool for finding patent uh, classifications. It's not always the easiest to use, it's not always the most attractive interface, but it does a nice job. And then there's our United States Patent Trademark Office, USPTO.gov. So I first encountered patents in the late 1990s when I was an undergraduate. Um, this website has not appreciably changed in that since then. Um, it's been 20 plus years and it looks basically exactly the same. Um, it is not terribly easy to use. It only covers the US and it, full text only goes back to the 1970s. It also separates patents and patent applications into two separate databases for some odd reason. Um, if you are doing a formal, thorough patentability search using the approved methodology of the USPTO, it works. If you are searching any other way, it is a dumpster fire. Um, I wouldn't recommend it unless you need to use it. Uh, there's some other tools that are available. Um, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has some other databases that you might want to search through, um, see who owns a patent, or to see the information about the patents application process. Uh, there's free patents online, there's lens.org. Different countries have their own personal, uh, not personal, but th their own uh, patent searching tools. Uh, South Korea's is actually really nice, Kipris. Uh, but, you know, it, it's a case of finding, it's all the same information. They're all working on the same baseline amount of data. It's just finding the specific features, the specific interfaces that work best. Uh, I should mention, this is not something that I, I normally advertise, but as, through, through the Patent and Trademark Research Center program, uh, I also have access to the actual Patent Examiner database. Um, and I can let people into that if they are interested. Uh, you just need to contact me and set up an appointment. Um, Everything I said about the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office's website, it's like that only 10 times more. It's harder to use. It's old an older interface. Um, but it, if you know what you're doing, and the learning curve is steep, if you know what you're doing, it is incredibly effective. All right. So I've got a couple of minutes left. I do, and I, I want to leave time for questions. Uh, but I also want to talk about trademarks. Uh, it's not something that I spend a ton of time on, but it's interesting and I thought I would share. All right, so trademarks are any sort of, sort of identifier that is used in commerce. We typically think of it as logos and slogans, but it can be something like sounds and colors. Um, the specific shade of Pink Panther insulation, that specific shade of pink is trademarked. Um, the NBC chimes, um, I, which I, I'm not even going to pretend to be able to do, are trademarked. Anything that would identify the source of a product is going to be trademarkable. Uh, the criteria, um, you know, it has to be used in commerce and it can't be generic, but it also can't look like somebody else's trademark. Um, so even if you just change the, the wording or change the spelling or, you know, add a logo or remove a logo, that's not good enough. It's still potentially confusing. And it also has to be in the right subject area. You know, you can't, you can't be doing this in the same uh, product family, basically. 
So some examples of some trademark uh, disputes that I've seen that are that I found interesting. Um, the uh, electronic music artist Dead Mouse um, tried to register his headwear. Uh, he wears this big Mickey Mouse style thing. Uh, and Disney, unsurprisingly, objected to that. Um, they have a trademark on the Mickey Mouse Club hat, and they argued that Dead Mouse's headgear uh, was confusingly similar. Uh, they ended up settling out of court for undisclosed terms. Uh, there was a high school football team that rebranded themselves. They got found a new uh, new mascot, new logo, and they basically just took the Dodge Ram logo and used that. Um, Dodge did not take that kindly, um, not so much because they were worried that this high school was going to start producing cars, uh, but because they were producing merchandise. Um, Dodge sells Dodge t-shirts, and they have a, uh, a trademark specifically for apparel. So when the high school tried to sell apparel with the logo on it, that was violating Dodge's trademarks. Uh, they, there was, again, it was all settled out of court, um, and the high school reverted to an older mascot. Uh, this one isn't the U.S., but uh, this is a trademark case from overseas. Um, soccer star uh, Lionel Messi uh, wanted to trademark his name for use with apparel. Um, and there's a, already a Spanish cycling uh, company called Massey, so Messi versus Massey. Um, and the cycling group argued that it would be confusingly similar since they're close enough in, uh, you know, in sort of subject area, shoes versus bicycles. Um, it's both athletic related stuff. Um, the EU uh, eventually ruled on this and they said, it's not quite close enough for this to be a problem. So Messi is able to sell Messi shoes. And my last example, um, Scouts. Um, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts for years had sort of a truce about who owns the term scouting, scouts or scouting. Uh, but then the Boy Scouts changed their name to Scouts BSA to be more inclusive. Uh, the Girl Scouts decided that, you know, okay, yes, it's good that you're inclusive, but people now don't see the distinction between your group and our group. Um, so they sued, um, arguing that the new name would cause would cause confusion. Uh, this dispute is still ongoing, um, but it may also be now be moot because uh, Scouts BSA has filed for bankruptcy. So, you know, still in progress. All right. So we have a little bit of time left, and uh, you know, just to recap, we talked about copyright and trade secrets. We talked about patents at length. And we talked about trademarks. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, and you can, in, for, for this, uh, if you'd like to ask questions, you can either ask them in the chat or uh, you can raise your hand in the, uh, in the participants list. Uh, if you go under participants, one of the options should be a little blue hand symbol. Um, and I can unmute you and ask that way. But either way works. All right. So Christy says uh, thank you. Uh, so it says uh, no questions, but a very good session, very informative. Thank you. Uh, Heather asked, uh, in our current COVID-19 economic environment, uh, many businesses are shuddering for good. At what point are their trademarks no longer protected? <sighs> My understanding is there is a regular fee associated with a trademark. Um, it's every couple of years. And I think uh, if you miss those payments, that's what triggers abandonment. Uh, but I'm not 100% sure on that. That is, that is something I would need to look up. All right, and um, from Jenna, 
what is the best way to search for patents before 1970? Um, if you're going by patent classification, the USPTO website has every patent all the way back to 1836. Um, there was a fire in 1836 that destroyed a lot of the patents from 1790 to then, uh, but 1836 to present, it, they've got every, they've got a copy of everything. Um, so that is an option. Um, some other resources have um, some of the third party resources like uh, Patent Lens and Free Patents Online have done a lot of work to take the optical character recognition stuff from Google and make that a little more keyword searchable. Um, so I would probably mix and match between those two, um, between USPTO and either Lens or Free Patents Online. Does that help? Oh, very good. Um, other questions? I think we got time for, for one more. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. Um, sorry for my voice uh, going out a little bit. I haven't talked this much in quite some time. Uh, and uh, yeah, hope everybody has a good day and uh, everybody comes back for the next one of these. Uh, I forget the topic, but it will be uh, another one of our faculty and staff uh, talking about something interesting related to libraries. Thank you, everybody.